Mark. Hello, Generals. We are back once again. This is Fiasco with Ultimate General Civil War. We are taking a look at the Major General Union campaign. And it's been a minute since I've done a uh, camp video uh, after a battle. So um, I've cleaned up i -Corps, as i -Corps is who I'm going to be taking into um, uh, probably some of the side skirmishes as we work our way through the uh, majority of the campaign. We picked up uh, the Iron Brigade and uh, used some combination of veterans and rookies to fill it out to fighting strength of 1,400. Uh, that, did, that did mean that there was a degradation in some of the stats. We kept um, the third perk, which is important, and these numbers can all come back up. So I'm not terribly worried about the stats coming down a bit. Their efficiency is still bonkers. Um, and uh, also importantly, we picked up the extra slot in uh, the division map. So I'm not mega worried about some of the stats coming down. They're still an absolutely premier unit with just some excellent, excellent combat capabilities. So I'm going to be for sure trying to maximize my utilization um, of them. You've also got a couple of the other units that picked up their second stars in i -Corps. And then the cavalry division in i -Corps is also simply excellent. Uh, you, can <laughs> you can absolutely tell which two units are the more generalist units and then which unit <laughs> is just all in uh, on melee. Uh, but we have not touched uh, second or third corps, and I don't think we're going to. Um, this is an attempt to take care of maximizing scaling, uh, the benefit thereof, as we look into the next campaign. So I've not even looked at where we're going. Uh, let's take a look here. Uh... Yep, please send us more dudes. He killed all of them. Um, and we need to inform him that divisions totaling 35 grand uh, are sent countering our movements, which puts their numbers in the mid-50s. Well, let's call it 53, generously. And a fighting core for me is, let's take out that number, so call it 17,000. Uh, give or take. So 17,000 times 3. We got, we still relatively even, even on the numbers. It's not perfect, but it's close. So we're ultimately working our way towards Fredericksburg, which is what I thought was probably going to be the next one, because I remember back when this game was in beta, this was where the end of the game was. And I remember Antietam being pretty much nearly in, near the end game. Now they've obviously added a bunch of other stuff, and you can theoretically fight all the way to Richmond or Washington, D.C., depending on who you're playing as. Uh, which is completely ahistorical, but okay. And <laughs> we'll, we'll get to it. So their numbers have been kept relatively in check, which is excellent. It's going to be great for us going forward. Um, and they're going to be, if we were to jump into Fredericksburg right now, which we'll just go ahead and do that so we can, or, sorry, which we'll do that so we can take a look at what's uh, coming up. We can see what we need to work with. So we still are looking at trying to run three major combat corps commands and then theoretically bringing in some reserves. Uh, what's interesting for me is that the uh, core size has jumped from 20 brigades being the maximum you can bring into a combat command to 25. So now it starts to make sense to bump up yeah so we, if we hit without doing anything else we've got the same numbers as they do. Um, or near enough to it without it makes sense to start trying to get um, the extra extra army org perk which is going to be I believe don't quote me in this uh, at army org 9 and at that point we may as well just go all the way to 10 um, so let's take a look at the state of the campaign I guess let's do that what's coming up is Perryville and Yuka let's take a look at which one happens first Yuka uh, or Luca I'm pretty sure it's an I um, and this is almost certainly going to be a one core battle and yeah, it's a smaller one core battle. Um, so I could use I core in this. I'll probably end up buffing up maybe three and seeing if I can't get some more even experience there, but we'll see. So you're facing off against roughly 10,000, um, Confederates and, uh, you know, 
you can bring a force that comes to this. So Yuka's going to be a smaller battle with 10 units. That's great. And then we've got Perryville. Let's take a look at what's coming up with Perryville. And this is kind of the thought process I'm going. I'm always doing when I'm, I'm playing these fights is I'm just sort of running a lot of those thoughts. All right, so to find the crossroads, this is a very, in my mind, this is a very easy fight. Uh, again, we could throw i into it. You wouldn't bring the whole thing, but that's fine. Um, let's jump back. So normally I like to have kind of a fourth holding core, uh, which is partially also why I'll need to bump up uh, Army Orc because three core has gotten big enough now that it can't, it can't really function as a holding core, um, which is what it had been doing previously. So I would usually be fighting with one or two and then all the overflow units would just get dumped into three, which is kind of why some of the numbers here are all messed up. Um, and for the most part, it looks like first division is actually pretty even in terms of the numbering. But um, in my other playthroughs, you'll notice the numbers get all great. Like here, second, second infantry, sixth infantry, 16th. It's all just jumbled. Um, we don't have a place to dump stuff. So wherever I'm going to be bringing to these battles, I need to have it. At this point, I should probably just double down on bringing i -Corps, but I'm kind of afraid of losing some of these generals. Um you got to think about where these battles are going to be. My strategy of trying to keep the experience gain relatively even. Uh, and then we need to get ready to grow our army to fight in Fredericksburg, which is probably going to mean that both of the perks from these fights go into um, Army Org. And then leading up to Fredericksburg, I'm trying to minimize my casualties here so that I'm preserving money and, and manpower so that going into Fredericksburg... Um, I have the resources I need to scale up the army because I'm going to need to add three units to I core, four units to two core, and then, you know, whatever I can afford to add to three core, which theoretically could be, you know, a lot. Uh, let's take a look at what's available for that. We got access to a shitload of parrots. Um, that's compelling. The 20 pound parrot is a great gun. And in those kind of numbers, that's enough for, I mean, my, my standard battery size is 10 guns these days. So that's enough. That's enough for something. Uh, we got a bunch of officers I haven't bought. A bunch of guns. We're still not really seeing great access to the 61. That's coming. Um, we did get some with, with rep. So I've got enough left over, but not quite enough for a unit. Uh, JF Browns. I... I the JF Browns are great. I do like the longer range, but I, I get plenty of good use out of the Sharps, and the Sharp is more readily available uh, in number. And I've, I've spent most of them bringing a lot of the Skirmisher units kind of up to fighting strength. So I, I've, I've gone through and I've bumped up the Skirmishers. And one of the Skirmishers who used to have a Burnside as their armament, which is, I think that used to be third? Probably, no, not third. Probably fourth. Uh, I ended up buying them Sharps. I, I have tried to make carbine skirmishers work and i'm sure there's a thing there's a way that that can work but it's just not it's just not clicking for me so if that's the case i'm not going to keep throwing good money after bad um and i'm just gonna give them sharps and just have a lot of long-range skirmishers so now both both of the, my my primary we'll call them combat commands have um light infantry units armed with sharps and and then one with JF Browns and those are my elite snipers. Uh, but everybody else, I mean, I'm I'm ecstatic with the performance of sniper skirmishers if I can keep the micro uh, aspect of their use under control. Oop. Go ahead and fill up 20 second. That took a lot of time. So as much as I'm tempted to keep throwing first core into the mix and it's going to screw up scaling because I don't have a lot of room for ballast units. I've got what, two? Um, I think the intent is to take whichever one of these two cores is more heavily weakened and it looks like two core was the one that got beat down the most, which is, it makes sense because they were the, uh, the vanguard. I'm going to go ahead and get them up to fighting strength and then handle um, Yuka probably in another video. Uh, you don't need to see me see me sitting here playing with you know individual values like this, but um, yeah. 
so that's a, it's a short camp video, I know, uh, but we're going to take a look at sort of where we're where we're planning on going, the resources we have, and the resources we're the objective we're trying to accomplish. So, as a quick overview, we need to be able to field three meaningful combat corps, and we can go up to twenty five per um, division or core. Sorry, per core. I would imagine we'll be able to fill up one and two core, no problem. And we'll struggle to fill up three core, but we'll see. Uh, I am not planning on opening a third cavalry division for three core, and I am probably also not planning on bringing in new um, sniper units. A, I lack the weapons to do so in the first place, and and B, I have a hard enough time keeping four units microed. <laughs> I'm going to like... It, these might be great units, but at a certain juncture, you as a player need to admit where you kind of run out of mental bandwidth. And I'm going to be frank, four is pushing it for me. Um, four skirmishers plus all of this artillery plus trying to keep on top of um, the infantry plus the cav, cav division here is kind of... Um, it's, a, it's a handful just to keep on top of that shit. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm going to bother with more sniper skirmishers, nor am I going to bother with more of a cav uh, division. So when both two and one and two core blow out and I can add that last um, brigade to each division in the fourth division, I'm going to be adding a new cav unit. So I'll add a new cav unit here. It'll be a traditional melee kind of cav. The same thing for um, second corps, uh, cav units as well and then three core is just going to be a shitload of infantry and cannons i mean we're getting to the point now where i'm i'm looking at a lot of artillery with nowhere to put it like if i get 12 more i'll have that and i'm i'm increasingly becoming a gigantic fan of the james look at all these these 24 pounders you know like this is going to be the siege the siege core like they're just just going to be dudes and guns um so that's probably what you're looking at for three core. Uh, so this one's going to be the move like a butterfly, sting like a bee core. And then this one's just going to be, um, you know, <laughs> what is subtlety, comrade? Uh, <laughs> it's just blast, blast the crap out of them with guns and then drown them in blue, blue clad, blo blue clad bodies. Uh, so let me, let's make sure I have the rifles to actually back that up. Um, looking at plenty of Enfields. I love the Enfield. I think it's a wonderful gun. A metric shitload of Springfield 55. So we've got plenty of those. And then enough Harper's Ferries as well that I think we should be fine. Um, and if it really comes down to it, I can lean back on some of the Lorenzes to sort of fill in the gap. I am uh, not mega worried about having to fall back on smooth bores. I won't go that far if I need to. And as well, 3-Core will likely have um, a heavier than usual complement of cannon relative to its peers. When I eventually can open a fourth core, it will become a ballast and holding core. So during side battles, it will have ballast units, which is just 500 men plus whatever smooth bar musket I can give, I can afford to throw away, and a bunch of um, majors and that kind of thing. Uh, and then whenever I'm doing a side battle, like let's say Perryville, where you can bring, I want to say, 12 guys. Um, 14, whatever, where you can bring 14 guys. I'll just take all of the stuff out of the combat core, dump it in the holding core so that I know for sure what I've, what I'm listed is what's coming. And then that way I'm, I'm ready to go. Uh, but this is going to be a short, quick, sharp one. We're just going to do a quick camp vid. I'm going to clean all this stuff up, uh, and see if we can't get probably some experience in two or three core. I, I, I think at this point, you know, I core is, is ready to be my rock star when it comes time for major battles, but two core, um, yeah, or three core with that leadership with the experience perk might actually be pretty useful as a, uh, a training kind of opportunity to kind of even out. There's a lot of really good training and good units in this, um, in this, uh, core here. And I mean, as much as I'm tempted to run these guys and pick up, the second star in a lot of these units, which, I mean, there's some value to that argument, and it, it would not screw up scaling as much as building up these core and jumping in. Because a lot of these core, 
they might be close to their second star. Brigades, sorry. A lot of these brigades might be close to their second star, but when I start buffing them back up with numbers, you know that they're going to lose. Just, to, like, just, just, just for example, let's go ahead and do second infantry. Um, we'll bring them up to 14 hundo. Boom. So it cost me nothing because I have just I have the guns already. There's some dudes. I'm going to be spending plenty of money on guns. I'm already aware of that. It's already happening. So they were, I mean, they were right around here. And now they're a little over the middle. Um, so I would expect that that's going to be the norm, you know, here. Oh, they could just about tip, tip over. Uh, maybe not. It costs a lot to do that. Um, in terms of experience, but it doesn't cost a lot in terms of money and it doesn't cost a lot in terms of guns and the quality of the units is still there. I'm still fine with these stats. I'm still fine with this level of efficiency. These units are good enough um, for the work that I'm asking them to do. And when I've got these superstar units... These these absolute rock star units. I know I can rely on them, but I don't need. You know, I don't I don't need to build an entire army of of two star space marine rock stars. I need a huge swarm of good enough. Does that make sense? Where at Antietam, I had enough maneuver brigades. And I had enough men. That the army was big going into that battle, and I could, I could open up fronts wherever I wanted. And while that meant that my individual units might not have been as amazing as they could be, it meant that I was able to really, to me anyway, it felt like I was able to control where the fighting occurred. Because if I ever felt like I was bumping up against a well entrenched position, or if I felt like I I, I didn't have a very obvious route of maneuver, I just opened a new front. I just pulled four brigades and opened a new front. And then the Confederacy had to kind of maneuver so that when it came time for me to ultimately take Sharpsburg, there was basically nothing to resist that push. Um, and so that's that's generally the strategy we're going after. It is, it's going to mean that I have a couple of rock star units and I, I do have an overwhelming preponderance of two star and general led units in i core, And that's, basically why I want to use, I think, two core, um, theoretically led by Bennett. I want to use two core to see if I can't start getting two core to that level as well. Um, and to the point where I'm confident this, this core could, could handle a significant fight and be just fine. Um, but I don't need to grind experience for these guys. They're all great. They're all good ready. This is an army that, you know, I'd take this army to Richmond. If if I was at this level of command with these with this experience and these numbers and everything, I'd take this army to Richmond, and I I need to get the experience up in the secondary core. So I think that's probably the plan going forward. I know that you've been hearing me ramble. I apologize for that, but these are some of the things you need to think about when you're looking at the meta campaign. Um, and it I generally think that this is the more interesting part of the game. Fighting the battles is certainly cool. Fighting the battles is really fun. Um, and it's it's there's a lot of tactical you need to be aware of, but I'm I'm I've always been a big picture guy, and in my professional life I'm also a a big picture strategy kind of dude. Um, oh wow, McClellan's gonna pick up a uh, third star here in a second. That's great. Uh, I, I I work in a big picture kind of field, and so I'm always kind of that's where I tend to tend to look. Um, and I, I I theoretically might buy the twenty pounders and then just replace second ordinance with uh 20 pound parrots we'll see um let's talk about artillery very briefly so there was a forum post on reddit i apologize for the kind of randomness and i am rambling so there was a forum post on reddit talking about cannons and um you know which ones are the best i think it's undeniable right that that the where is it um there you go the 24 pound howitzer is the king of the battlefield it's the it's the king of kills anyway. I mean these these numbers are stupid, uh, and this isn't even one of my good ones. Where not an I core. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Seventh howitzer kicking butt. Uh, eighth howitzer 
These are just they're murder machine units. I mean, you, have, you see, I've got two large battery or brigades of them. I've got another one. Um, I've got a counter battery unit that. I mean, yeah, their kills aren't as good, but they're killing generals and they're killing cannon crewmen. And the James, uh, I've been very pleasantly surprised with how useful the 14-pound James is. Let's talk about cannons for a bit. Um, so the six-pound field's pretty crap. And it's a fantastic, like, flying horse kind of, or flying artillery uh, kind of gun where it just sits right on the ass of your infantry and fires away. What's nice about that as well is it's got pretty good canister and you don't really care if you lose any. Um, you can capture a bunch of these from the Confederates. I would never spend a single dime on anything on these four, well, the wired I would, but the these the six pound field the 12 pound howitzer and the 12 pound napoleon i would not spend a penny on them and that's i'm gonna get to that in a second so six pound field i use it basically until shiloh or a little after shiloh because i have so many i capture that i want to fill out my units start getting experience start getting kills the six pounder you want this right behind your infantry on their ass the entire time hugging their butt providing canister and, and shell uh, or uh, yeah shell um, support. The wired is like a poor man's three inch. Um, and it is surprisingly surprising how good it is. Um, it's performing rel in relative parity to the three inch ordinance for about half the, well, not half, a little, a little under half the cost. It's way cheaper and it's only available in limited numbers, but it's, it's inexpensive to pick up the five or so you get access to in every major battle window and then just start standing up rifled units and they're great um they're great they're just effective jack of all trades longer range guns so you can use napoleons or you can use the howitzer guns to handle close in work but you can use the wired you can use the three inch ordinance the 10 pound parrot 20 pound parrot the 14 pound james to handle long range work and uh, um the wired is the best poor man's heavy gun or poor man's long range gun that i've come across it's accurate surprisingly so it's got pretty good rate of fire um and i wouldn't use it for anything mega close and work you there are frankly better and more available guns for that role um but it does okay 12 pound howitzer is i mean the, the six pound field and 12 pound howitzer are both guns left over from the mexican-american war and that's why they're in the game it's why they were used in the war um 12 pound howitzer is fine it's fine it's the most average mac gun around it is a straight upgrade from uh no it's not it's it's just I don't know. I don't find a lot of use for the 12 pound howitzer beyond um, the early game. When I'm using it because I have it for free, yeah, of course. Obviously, I fill my gun my gun batteries up. But the second I have the opportunity, I take a howitzer unit and I turn it into a 24 pound howitzer unit every time. Um, the 12 pound howitzer, I love because you get it for free. By which I mean, I mean, you could pay money for it. You could pay thirteen hundred dollars for it right now and buy a gun or you can spend rep on it or whatever i love the napoleon because it performs well and because you get so many by capturing them from the confederates that you never need to worry about buying them and you never need to worry about if you take losses with a napoleon there's so many of them it doesn't matter it's fine um they are an excellent jack of all trades uh, medium range gun that I use to support infantry and close work and then occasionally start tossing shell on nearby generals or small artillery units that kind of thing uh, the three inch ordinance or the 10 pound ordinance is a phenomenal jack of all trades that is uh, a more long range version of the Napoleon but it's still still pretty pretty okay in in um, close work I would not lean on it too much. It, it was one of the more ubiquitous guns in the war. It was, I think, the most ubiquitous gun on the Union side um, and, and does really, really good work. So don't turn it down if you see it, especially if you get it as a rep award or as a capture. Definitely stand up a battery. Uh, I like having a lot of different kinds of guns because historically they had a lot of different kinds of guns. So if I just have a shitload of 24-pound howitzers, it feels ahistorical to me and it breaks, it breaks for me the role play. Um, I really wanted to like the 10 pound parrot. I wanted it for counter battery work. I wanted it for long range work and I have generally been unimpressed. It is expensive. It is rarer than I would like it to be less. So now in the war, it seems like, but it was initially kind of hard to come by and I am not a fan. Um, I don't have access to the Tredegar in the, 
Union campaign. I have no idea if it's any good from the Confederate perspective. Last time I played, I tried using Tredegers and was just really unimpressed with them. So maybe it's good. Maybe I suck. I don't know. Uh, the 12 pound Whitworth, I have a battery of these in my army and I'm really trying to figure out what makes them tick. They're stupid accurate and they've got nutso range, but, um, it's been my experience. They don't hit all that hard. Uh, and I'm not super duper impressed. Uh, admittedly, this is only in big battles. So who knows? Uh, they really haven't done a great deal of, uh, of work to impress me and I'll probably be replacing, the Whitworths here with the when I upgrade second ordinance to 20 pound parrots I'll probably push those down to the Whitworth unit and then sell the Whitworths and decom them because I'm I'm just not seeing it I'm I'm sure they're fine I'm just not seeing it for me the dark horse of this campaign has been the 14 pound James 24 pound howitzer I knew I was gonna love it's a king it's a killer it's great 10 pound parrot it's the same thing but for long range so, so the 24 pound howitzer up close is a monster and the 10 pound parrot at range is a monster the surprise for me has been the 10, 14 pound James uh, it's a great poor man's 20 pound howitzer or 20 pound uh, parrot and it's also surprisingly good at counter battery work um, it can also fill in and do some pretty surprisingly good work as well in um medium range work so it's just effective at everything it's not um yeah it's average or effective at everything but it's average obviously it's better at longer range so where you have your napoleons and your howitzers doing close in work i've got my 20 pound parrots firing at their extreme range killing stuff and then i've got my james kind of doing some work in the middle there and that in that not quite canister but not quite shell or sorry not quite solid bolt range the 14 pound james shines in that realm and um i think this is this is a great gun that i have been overlooking for a long time and i'm really glad i've tried it out it's doing some doing some excellent great work uh so that's kind of an overview of the cannons i think all of these guns have a place and in some cases, the place that I'm making finger quotes now and you can't see because I don't have a camera is that it's free. Um, everything you do here in this in this mode of the game, in this strategy mode of the game is um, making a choice and balancing the opportunity cost of taking that thing versus something else. It is inarguable that mathematically the 20 pound parrot and the 24 pound howitzer are just some of the strongest guns in the game it is an inarguable fact they are but what's interesting or interest or or what you consider as far as the strategy is how much did it cost how many can you bring etc so forth and so on sometimes bringing more guns is better and if that means you need to bring more worse guns then you do that except for like replacement men so uh elite or sorry veteran men to bump up the unit or whatever i haven't spent one single penny on my napoleon unit and i think i only have the one yeah my wired unit has done well my napoleon units have done well i've got another okay so i haven't spent i've got a third i haven't spent a single penny on any of these Napoleon units except for replacement dudes. The actual guns have all been captures. And that's something you need to consider when you're building your army. That's that much more money I can put into supply. It's that much more money I can put into more soldiers or better weapons for the soldiers or support like snipers or skirmishers or cav units. Um, because if I can knock out a, a general or knock out a cannon unit with concerted sniper fire that frees up cannon to fire at line infantry. And if line infantry is under morale shock because they're getting shelled, they're not going to charge. And if they're not going to charge, they're doing less damage overall to my infantry who I, I think my heaviest casualties come from a getting caught out in the open. Cause I'm confused or I'm focused somewhere else or I'm stupid, which does happen. I'm human. My heaviest casualties come when they get into melee and I'm I'm forced to do close in 
either melee work or forest fighting. And that's where most of the casualties came in here. You notice that the rest of these units didn't get hit all that hard. This unit was already that small going into the battle. Um, I core, I didn't need to do that much to bump it up. Where two core got fucking reamed is because they were in the woods. They were in the woods north of north of Dunker Church, and the Confederates were able to cycle charge, send one unit in, have it get shattered and run away, send another unit in, have it get shattered and run away. They were flying columning my infantry, and that's where some of these horrendous casualties come from. And once the artillery was able to get online and start shelling the Confederates, they stopped charging. And I was able to establish artillery superiority relatively early because I had snipers. So... The efficacy of a Napoleon doesn't come from the fact that it's not as good of a gun as a howitzer. The howitzer, the 24-pound howitzer is just a better gun, period. But the Napoleon's free. And when you can have, early on in the campaign, at most, a single battery of 8-pound howitzers, or sorry, a single 8-gun battery of 24-pound howitzers, if that's all the artillery you bring because you're only bringing the best gun on the battlefield, you're going to find yourself outgunned real quick. I have a firm belief, and the, the guiding principle of this strategy for this campaign is good enough is exactly that. The Napoleon is a strictly average gun. It's hot garbage at long range. I don't use it for, hot, for, for long range. But it's free. And when I need it for that very close-end canister work or that medium-range shell work, it's good enough. And when you're looking at bang for buck, opportunity cost, maximizing your bang, minimizing your output, there's simply no better thing you can do than free. That's why I like to use captured guns as much as I can. That's why uh, when I'm done with this playthrough and I'm finally playing Panda Kraut's um, Rebalance mod, uh, I'm going to be excited for the idea of capturing guns. That will be super cool. And uh, yeah, I just you, you can't beat free. You can't beat free when it comes to bank for buck. So the Napoleon is a meh gun at best. It, it really is a meh gun, it's, but it's, it's good enough and it's free. It's great in short and work where your infantry really needs to help anyway. And then you've got Jameses and, and Parrots for long range stuff. Um, I, yeah. Yeah, it's just that's the way it breaks down. So, uh, sorry, I've, I've rambled. It's This is a topic I find very fascinating. This this part of the game is, to me, the best part. This is what makes this game sing. If you, if you, you know, put me in battles and just have me fight, okay, fine, I'll get bored of that in a week. This is the part of the game that makes me sing, uh, makes me happy. Uh, so we're going to jump into uh, Yuka in the next video. I'll clean up two core and send them into the grinder and see what happens coming out the other side. I can't wait for Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg is a slog, um, but it is, it is I think, one of the more fascinating battles in the war. Just like Antietam, it's an opportunity for you to really play on a huge map. Let's take a look again really quick. You get to fight over all this damn thing. Like, like the, the cutoff for the screen is, like I think, here. You don't get a whole lot of this stuff back here. You don't get to like have the, the this side of the camp. It really is focusing on the battle at Marysville Heights and then down here. And then it, in my previous experience, especially as the Confederates, um, this part of the battlefield doesn't really end up being fought over all that much. So it's just a lot of fighting down here. And then you just kind of sit here with your, you know, twiddling your thumbs, waiting until the second wave comes in and then you push up. Because you could just send your dudes in and like just have them slaughtered wholesale. Um charging marysville heights but why i mean just why so anyway i think fredericksburg is excellent it's not i think as dynamic as antietam i think i love antietam because there's so much opportunity for grand um battlefield maneuver and in that regard i also like chickamauga a lot i think Chim chickamauga is a great really fun battle because it's one of the few times where you're not just sort of like playing camp the flag and you have this gigantic battlefield to play over i think chickamauga is probably like the the piece de resistance of this whole campaign. Um, yeah, I've rambled long enough. I apologize. Thanks for sticking this out. This is Fiasco. Uh, we are playing Ultimate General Civil War on the Major General playthrough. We are getting ready for Fredericksburg, but before that, we got to stop off at Yucca and Perrysville and work on grinding out that Army Org rep so I can get my um, sixth unit or fourth. Sixth unit per division. And we can go into that battle with as many blue-clad 
soldiers as possible. I hope uh, you had a good time. I hope you learned something. And uh, I will talk to you guys next time. It's Fiasco signing out.